Welcome to PartialArc.com. <laughs> Don't do that. In the grim darkness of the far future, there is only war. And a lot of weird shit. Roll to seize! <laughs> Welcome to Roll to Seas. This is episode 40. I'm your host, Jay Jones, and I'm joined by my co-host and Warhammer enthusiast, Andrew Dickinger. That's me. Andrew, crazy times here in the Brown Library. So many, so much madness, so Always. much running around. I mean... All it, the time. It, it's in the warp, <laughs> so yeah. I mean, do you think the webway is ever going to get taken over by chaos? I mean, it, it already is in places. Yeah, I mean, but like... We're going to be fine, right? Oh, uh, we'll be fine. They don't ever get in here. We'll be fine. I'm sure they will tell us before anything bad happens, because they love us so much. Right? They'll give us warnings. The Harlequins? That, de- that death stare that that solitaire gives us, I'm sure, means he's, he's I our I appreciate you, and I, <laughs> and I will protect you if anything bad happens. But yeah, I mean, it's it's been really crazy for us, too, because over the last week, I mean, last week we weren't able to make it out to Kamarag for our regular arena episode because we've been busy doing this whole thing with Mortals, yes. our board game. Mortals Descent of the Gods. Yeah, and it's been it's been really crazy, and um, it's been something that we've actually been working on for years here yes. in the Brown Library, and uh, we finally have it out there on that orc kickstarter uh website yes <laughs> that they've created it's got to be green and uh right now we're you know just wanted to call out to you guys uh, listeners out there on terra and across the universe the big thing with us with mortals descent of the gods not only do we do we love it as a game but it's kind of a big gateway for us here in the brown library to do a lot more yes we want to expand but we're still very small so any support that you guys can throw our way is going to go a long way yeah whether that's hopping on kickstarter and actually backing the game itself or we're telling a friend out there and just saying, hey, I know you really like board games. This might not necessarily be for me, but I think this is really cool and you guys should check it out. Yes, we appreciate any support you guys can give us. Yes, we have great designs in future for things that we can do here in the Brown Library. Um, we'd love to do more uh, episodes like this. We'd love to do more Dark Heresy. Yeah, we want to expand. But we need help. So if you're out there and you're thinking, man, I'm here on Terra. Everything's terrible and gross all Terra, the time. Terrible. It's terrible. Oh, boy. <laughs> that was real bad. <laughs> and uh, if only I could escape to a world where I could be a once god with magical powers and blowing up monsters. Well, there's a board game out there. Or maybe, you know, escape a death world. I hear the board game helps do that. Right? Yeah, I mean, you just challenge the monsters to a game of mortals yeah. and then all gets solved. They're like, if I win, it's like, well, it's a cooperative game, so we all win. The Katachan devils learn the value of cooperation. Oh, man, that's how, that's how you mend fences in the 40k universe. Just play board games with them. Cooperative yeah. board games. Yeah. That makes sense. <laughs> Well, guys, um, please check out Mortals Descent of the Gods on Kickstarter. We really, really appreciate it. We do. But anyways, talking about the crazy stuff in the 40K universe, I know my uh, my pointy ears have been a-tingling this week yeah, yeah, and this month. You stupid, pointy-eared <laughs> bastard. Eldartober, right? Yeah, yeah, they missed the mark yeah. not doing Orktober, man. Yeah, we were talking about this. They really missed the mark to do Orktober. And it is confirmed that it's November. Like, yeah. come on, Games Workshop, Orktober. Like Eldartober. Why? It just doesn't, doesn't really roll off no. the tongue. <laughs> No, I mean, they could have just, you know, pushed Eldar to next year. Well, I mean, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no, bias? So there's bias much? There's some people out there who are like, yeah, yeah, right? Sal- salty dog. Just never comes out. <laughs> hey, they they haven't been they haven't been crushing it in tournaments or anything They're like that. They're still hitting the top tiers. Listen, we know Eldar really needs help because <laughs> all the other races are up there. We've got Necrons in the top eight. We've got Orcs in the top eight. We've got Tyranids in the top I mean, just give Eldar a bone. They've needed it, man. They've... They- <laughs> It just had it bad for years. Um, yeah, so uh, Eldar is getting the bump, but I think before we talk about Eldar and dive Ooh. straight in, we should talk about one thing that happened in the FAQ recently. Yeah, there was an FAQ this past weekend. There was a great scream heard across the vastness of space. So uh, it was the scream of 
the conscript. Yeah, Astro Militarum Commissioner. Running away. No longer uh, give you the, you just lose one guy. Just gives you a re-roll to your morale now. Just gives now. you a re-roll. Gives you that, um, what is that for Space Marines? Oh, and, and they shall know no fear, basically. Yeah. It's it's like, and they shall know no fear. Yeah, pretty much. But you have to kill a conscript to do it. Well, you have to kill one, and then it also doesn't just make it, hey, I lost 15 guys, but guess what? I only lose one more. Yeah. No more of that mm, shenanigans. No. Now, there is a warlord trait out there that specifically still lets lets them kind of do the old ability i believe it's called the draconian oh it's something. the destroyans i believe get yeah that it's like draconian something warlord trait which lets them if they do fail it again they just do d3 mortal wounds to the unit and they pass yes but still you're losing at a minimum of two guys now it's like draconian discipline and i believe like you have to have that warlord trait for it so it's not like any commissar can do it yes so it's still like yes it's not a big sweeping change because there's still some traits out there that can help it but like man that's a pretty big i didn't not expect that i thought when the codex came out and they made it like four plus for the conscripts to get orders i thought that was the big change but holy crap gw was uh was waiting in the wings with this big one well i mean they understood that having literal conscripted soldiers being the most or one of the most intractable units in the game didn't really make sense yeah and just fluffy wise it's interesting to have like all these like conscripted dudes just like looking at a horde of tyranids and there's just like these monsters coming like i think we're all gonna run and the commissar like shoots one guy's like are you sure about that and then they look back and they're like yeah yeah (laughs) in fact if you could shoot me that would be great so me and a a buddy of ours uh named mike fox he's part of our gaming group uh we were talking about it and uh we were like yeah wouldn't they just instead turn on the commissar and then just shoot him probably because they're conscript now the trained soldiers wouldn't like i'm all for the katia dudes who are badass oh, hardened yeah. veterans the like they, they stand being, their ground but conscripts yeah who the knows? Australian firstborn that literally intentionally sign up because it's like a family yeah thing. it's like an honor thing yeah so yeah I, that makes sense but when they're literally just pulling dudes from prisons or like off the street and being like guess what you're in the army now yeah yeah we'll, we'll so see much. we'll see how much of a change this impacts i mean it definitely has a pretty big impact it has a substantial inc- impact on their screen for sure yeah so we'll see how this changes things going forward but now let's talk about my space keeblers i want to talk about your pointing your bastards space keeblers uh so yeah it looks like uh you know a lot of this still speculation at this point beyond what uh they've shown us on warhammer community but in general the army as a whole got major reductions across the board now Um, we don't have all the specifics because at the time of this recording here in the brown library time is weird and uh the codex is still in pre-order it hasn't been released by the great workshop just yet no wibbly wobbly but there have been rumors and things out there on the uh on the great vox interwebs um about point reductions and specific new rules so we can yep. speak to quite a bit of it actually general reductions in costs for like a lot of the units that seemed over costed like things like spirit seers and stuff like that and even are... just random ones like striking scorpions got like i believe like a four point reduction and like warp spiders and just a bunch of random changes around the one points. oh yeah the ones that definitely surprised me were dark reapers i don't Ooh, think they yeah. needed a point cost they reduction got a nice big old reduction yeah like 36 points for what they do is already really good and then you put in the craft world traits and mm-hmm. it's still really good but then they got dropped even further and now, i was like now they're with I don't know if that was a good choice. one dark reaper with a reaper launcher is 27 points so good 81 points for three pretty nice very tasty tasty yeah but um, and, and also they had like a lot of really cool releases with like they did this on the warhammer community pages and since the pre-order has gone up even more stratagems have been revealed yes it's like all the cool things they can do and i can tell you as like an eldar player who's you know obviously if you've been listening for the last few months i've been primarily focused on harlequins and just getting all of my all of my clown towning out while i can and now with some of the new stuff that's come out that we can talk about right now it's it's finally giving me what i was hoping for with eldar Eldar, which is like a little bit more of that i mean i guess you could say it's like trickery but like a lot of different options to engage with eldar well uh talking about the craft world traits specifically there are a few clear winners Aladic being one of them yeah Aladic, i believe is like yes Tan's cool leandon's cool i think Ulthway is probably the weakest of all of them but i'm sure there's plenty of people out there who've 
who feel like it, it could be really useful based on how they build their army. Well, the, the thing is, is that it's like I'm hit or miss with Oathway because Oathway essentially got a six up disgustingly resilient to the whole army. Yeah. Where I see this being more valuable is for the multi wound units. Yeah. Because it could it could be the, the difference between keeping one alive or dying. And there I see it being really powerful. But for like the hordes of infantry and stuff, it's like one of six guys is going to get a save. And then if it, they're getting hit by multi wound weaponry, then it's basically not going to happen. Yeah. So, don't know how I feel about them yet. Their Black Guardian stratagem, though, is yeah. really strong. It's really cool. And I love Black Guardians. And Ulthway is my... I mean, Eldred Ulthran is, like, my favorite character, character in, the game. in the game. Yeah. Um, and I've already pre-ordered his new model, that's out, because <laughs> I don't know if I'll use him, but I will have that model. I will, I I've will, been waiting for that forever. I will be disappointed if you don't use I know. Him. I will figure out a way. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, but, yeah, I would say probably... If I had to pick two, now Sam Hain's really good too as well. I think it comes down to like what your army is. Yeah, basically. I, well, I, I think I keep looking at Sam Hain and I'm like, actually, you know, if like I see like warlock conclaves, bike, mm-hmm. biker warlock conclaves. Now with those new powers, my goodness, they can Ooh. do some really nasty stuff. Warlock conclave being able to do the the assault shenanigans with uh, with Sam Hain's, it's real strong. Yeah, and now the new like all the new powers that have come out, like I think Runes of Fate got some some new interesting powers, but really for me. Runes of Battle. Runes of Battle is two new nasty powers. They're real strong. Like for me, it's Jinx and Quicken. Yeah. Like Jinx, which if anybody doesn't know, the, how the Runes of Battle powers work is they have kind of like a, a duality thing where yes. they they can either cast it on a friendly unit and buff them, or they cast it on an enemy unit and nerf them. Yeah. Well, Jinx is a minus one to all saves. Yes. Which all saves. That's invulnerable so, saves. Suddenly giving Mortarian instead of a 4 plus, a 5 plus invul save. Uh, yeah, that dramatically changes his yeah. survival. We call him Mortarian because I think these days he's kind of the boogeyman right now. Uh, well, we've both played against and him he's now. he's really hard to kill. He is so hard to get rid of. Yeah, so anything that can uh, help towards Mortarian is definitely appreciated, but yeah, making him 4 plus to 5 plus invul is like nasty. It's a big deal. With off of a, a 37 point model with I a mean, witch blade. Yeah, like, I mean even even thinking about like this, even th- going against something like just a knight, a knight titan, and suddenly making its only save against your ranged weapons like uh, the 5 plus invul save, suddenly a 6 up invul save is like it's really good. It's essentially giving, oh, uh, this is the way I described it it's essentially giving you minus 1 rend against all saves for any weapon. Yeah, it's, re- it's amazing That's and, very powerful. And the other side of it too, the other power quicken is warp time which yeah. is an amazing ability to be able to do a move again is incredible for an army like eldar which is already so so fast and now with a stratagem called webway strike you can now do the old classic move of mm-hmm. wraith guard dropping in with d sides dropping a spirit seer behind him throw some quicken on him and now you've got d sides right within that flamey threat radius so it's yeah. back folks now you can only do it once because you can't do more than two units in a webway strike. Yes. They, they wisely capped it at one CP to do one unit, three CP to do two. So if you want to do that quicken with D size, you got to spend it on both the Spirit Seer or a Warlock, I guess, but you're going to want to use a Spirit Seer probably. Yeah. Um, but like Spirit Seer and Wraith Guard, and uh, those are your two units. You can get one really nasty flame damage out of it. Yeah, I mean, it's definitely, the, it's it opens up the options for the army. And we mentioned Elatic before. If you don't know what the Elatic trade is, why this is one of our winners. Oh yeah, we should talk about that. It gives every unit in the army a minus one to hit when they're beyond 12 inches from the enemy it's so good and it's everything that's the thing like with raven guard and with other armies we've seen a similar trait like it this was before. like infantry only. it's infantry and maybe like a dreadnought or bikes yeah but this it's everything wraith knights wave serpents everything gets it. yeah the only other army that we've seen that has the everything rule is uh the stygies forge world for adeptus mechanicus they right. also have the minus one to everything which we've already seen with people like uh jeff in control robinson using very strong oh yeah very strong and with getting the minus one to hit i think the big thing to take away from what we're hearing or seeing with some of these releases from the eldar codex is is that I think their kind of big thing they're going to be able to do, they're going to be the minus to hit army. Yeah. Because they have a lot of tricks now, especially with Elatic, with one of their stratagems called Lightning Fast Reflexes, or Lightning Reflexes, which basically lets anything that fly or an infantry add a minus one on top of it for two CP. Yep. You can get units that can easily get up to minus three, minus four to hit, yeah. which is crazy. Like, 
For example, Rangers, which are way cheaper now, already have a minus one. With a Leytic trait, they get minus two. If you do the lightning fast reflexes on them, they have minus three. And then if you use conceal, which is a warlock power, that's another minus one. That's a minus four on a unit. Yeah, so it is it is essentially possible with combos in the new Eldar Codex to have things immune to range shooting. Ironically, there is an Eldar unit that completely denies all of that, which is Dark Reapers, uh, which we mentioned previously. But against most armies, it's possible to make units in your army immune to shooting. And I can attest playing Harlequins, which across the board just have just a basic minus one. So strong. Just having a minus one on most of my army that gets shot at, especially in the beginning, is a huge way to mitigate damage on fairly weak units. I can attest to it by playing Nids, having that uh, Malanthrope giving the bubble of minus one to say, like, all of my biovores causes nightmares in people because suddenly you're hitting real bad and you're just like, those fucking four wound <laughs> things just won't die. And yeah. it's just like, yeah. Yeah, even a mo- stock minus one, very strong. Going above that, kind of dirty. Yeah, so I think we're going to see the uh, the universe of minuses to hits is going to be opened up with Eldar, so uh, we'll see where it goes. But I'm really excited about the Codex. Obviously, next time I play it, I'll give uh, a larger update on how the game went and how I feel the army's going now in 8th. But now, into our favorite section, our Seasons of the Month. Jay, you're going first. Oh, come on. I thought if I was just quiet for a little bit longer, you would like somehow fall into it. You know, like my Seasons of the no, Month. No, I did that last time. Pit trap. No, yeah. no, I did I, that last time. I just You're stare going. into your eyes, <laughs> use my magic powers on you. You, you. you have no effect on me, Jay. What? My psychic powers don't work anymore? I'm a Tordarian. <laughs> <laughs> Whoa. Whoa. Oh, my God. So many universes meshing in one. All right. Well, since I have to go first, I'll tell my tale of woe. So, um, I actually, in this recent last tournament, I went up against a Tau army. I'm still running my Harlequins. Strange. Yeah, Tau's, Tau's out there. Um, they're still pulling shenanigans. I think I've mentioned before how their stupid drones can be really sneaky. Drones are the make or break for Tau army. But this one, uh, this mistake was, I mean, as always, never my mistakes are ever my fault. They're always someone else's fault. I don't know who it is, but I'll figure them out eventually and stop them from making me make mistakes. But um, this one was my fault, I guess. It comes down to basically deciding how you're going to charge a unit. So to give you the lay of the land, this guy had a, a pretty standard what you see Tau army. Pretty standard. There were some broadsides. There were some big suits. No riptides, but the uh, what are they called? Not the riptides, but they're they're cousins from Forge World. Uh, the it was either Yavara or Yavara uh, Ravarna. Those the Yavara was the one. It was two Yavaras with the crazy flamers and stuff like that. They're nasty. They're really good. Um, he had two of those. He had a couple broadsides, uh, I think two hammerheads. And he had this really interesting formation, this thing that I really want to focus on, which is where my folly came from, is I want to describe it. It's kind of like a fidget spinner type formation where you have this one commander, this Tau commander, who adds, I believe, additional shots. Do you know what this is called? Yeah, it's called a Cadre Fireblade. He's a, he's basically like a veteran fire warrior. He has a, an ability called Volley Fire. Models in Sept units within six inches of the Sept Cadre Fireblade may fire an extra shot with pulse pistols, pulse carbines, pulse rifles, and when shooting at the target within half range. Yeah. So these things are pretty nasty because they can get all these additional shots. Yeah. And he basically had it set up where he had this this guy in the center and i say fidget spinner because he had six units kind of spread out of it almost like tentacles like <laughs> like leeching back to this center guy so as he was marching up the field with this basic tau fidget spinner was moving up the field these things were just like spinning off of him firing all these freaking additional shots and it was pretty nasty especially because as harlequins my highest toughness is t5 and that's on my star weavers mm-hmm. which is the uh thing that carries all of my units it's the transport that carries my Harlequins. I have about five of them. And essentially what was happening is I was getting up close with them to drop out my Harlequins. And with strength five guns and with that many shots, they were like punishing my Star Weavers. Yeah, I mean, even regular Fire Warriors with pulse rifles at 15 inches are firing three shots each. Yeah. Like. So I was, I got a little too close to them, which was my first mistake. <laughs> and I should have just stayed back. And because they're just infantry, I could have just, with all of my shuriken cannon shots, just slowly whittled them down. But instead, I flew right up close to them, so I'm within half range, so you can just start punishing the crap out of my Star Weavers. But the biggest mistake came after I hopped out of my Star Weavers. So my Harlequins are preparing to make a big charge on this super fidget spinner, like, of just six units. And I've got my Star Weavers there. Some of them survive the attack. And I get ready, and I start charging in, but just with my Harlequin units. 
I start charging in with just, I usually actually use my troop master to charge in because my troop master is five wounds. And instead of charging in with my troop first, I usually send him in because if I take like two or three wounds, it doesn't kill somebody. And he still, and then he locks them and then they can't. And the other guys can still charge in. Well, with all those extra pulse shots and with their greater good, these units were just a eviscerating my army like they killed a troop master they were killing other troop units and i completely forgot in the moment i think it was just out of like pure like holy crap these things are crazy i forgot to charge with my star weavers because uh that probably would have probably would have done it yeah you always charge the star weavers first that's what they're there for yeah it was for whatever reason i think i was just like and i usually do it in most games i either if i my star weaver's still alive i'll charge with it or i use my troop master but for whatever reason, I forgot to charge with the Star Weaver, and the Overwatch was so strong. He would like blew away two Harlequin units before I finally was like, "Oh yeah, that's right. I've got this big dumb vehicle here to charge in." So finally got it in. Finally locked up a few of them, but I still lost like two units to all the Overwatch because it's just so many units with so much firepower. Well, yeah, and the reason they do that star pattern is so essentially all of the units are within six inches of each other, so they can all do for the greater good supporting fire. Yeah, which is like it is the great. Tau fidget spinner, and I fear it to this day. <laughs> but uh, yeah, that was definitely my big seize of this past month, is just remembering when to charge, and more importantly, how to charge, the order, right? Because especially with this edition, that's the biggest way to overcome the crazy, crazy overwatch that can happen. So... That was my C's. Andrew, what's yours? So I've been practicing with AdMech because logistically I will be able to have AdMech ready for LBO. So I was playing against uh, a friend of mine who I mentioned earlier in this podcast, Mike Fox. He's actually just branched out into his n- first new army of 40K in years. Yay! He is a hardcore orc player, but he actually picked up the new Death Guard because he was a big fan of the models and just wanted a big change. And they're awesome. And he just transitioned to a different type of green because... Yeah, he was like, I got, I got so much green green paint i can't i can't get rid of it but yeah practicing against death guard is good because it gives you the sense of probably one of the most frustrating armies to try and shoot yeah if you're like i think i know how much firepower it takes to kill a unit you don't you You don't don't know until you fight death guard especially because uh he has the death guard dice and apparently they were made for him because he just he doesn't he rolls saves a little bit around average maybe slightly less but his disgusting resilient rolls are like it's a three plus right like, he he is truly channeling nurgle every time he rolls yeah i mean he gets literally two-thirds of the disgustingly resilient rolls every time he rolls it's kind pretty of magical insane. so yeah i was like i mean the first time i shot at Mort- mortarian i even did wrath of mars with six robots and i was like oh yeah he's fucking he's toast. gonna die and only took half a south away i mean it was uh it was sad it was a sad all day those, all those mortal wounds and he's just like disgustingly resilient and i made of course the trademark mistake because call B- uh, belisarius call was my warlord his bubble is nine inches instead of six so i can always just keep him far away for some reason i decided to put him in his 12 inch gun range to mercarian no which was dumb he survived on one wound oh, because God. i made five of six five up invulnerable saves holy crap hilarious he was not happy um and then of course he leaves combat repairs himself then gets repaired by another guy and he's back up to six and it was yeah fucking stupid. that's kind of the trick with belisarius call if you don't kill him in one go he's back to full health oh and the characters you have to kill in one go because they essentially have the best repairing mechanics in the game yeah they got all those little those little spiders all those little <laughs> pixie spiders but the mistake i made so i played admech a bunch in six and seventh edition i was a big advocate for the robots yeah like before people started really using the robots i i just love the robots they were just my favorite having the guns being these super platforms and being really tough was just my thing and i love that their repulsor grid like reflect shots back that yeah. was really rad you also i'd like to call out had a pretty uh cool like paint and design scheme for them where uh andrew was putting on the front face of all of them basically to look like tv screens yes instead of like a like a big metal cap and there were these big tv screens with like a smiley face on them or like just emojis they had different emojis on as which their faces is terrible terrifying and hilarious to have these like big silent robots just like scanning the field with a big like yellow smiley face like hey everybody yeah the ones B-b-b-b-b-b. that would just be walking would be like white and then just a neutral face and then like if they're about to shoot you they'd they'd be like a yellowish with a smiley face and then if they are shooting you it'd be red with like an angry an face. angry face <laughs> oh my god you could make exchangeable heads for their different settings so that you know when they're in Aegis oh, mode, or when you know 
when they're in gun mode. Ah, oh, Jay, what do you got to do? Why I do you added a project for why you. Why do you got to do this to me? That would be amazing. Anyways, back to your story. Um, So it has relevance to that. Yeah, it does. Uh, and you already knew that, you son of a bitch. <laughs> uh, but okay, so the way that their protocols work is you declare it during, I believe, your movement phase. And then it, it doesn't take effect, though, until the beginning of the next turn. Mm-hmm. You're planning ahead. You're planning ahead, essentially. There is a stratagem that for one CP, you can permanently change them on the spot in any phase yours or your opponents to one of the modes but they basically can never if you do that they can never go back to the mode they just were so that's like really good if you have an extra cp and like you need them to suddenly switch to aegis and then you'll never get the double shooting again but like you'll be but they'll never die <laughs> well that, i mean aegis is, just makes them so hard to get rid of especially when you give them the cover canicle oh my god they're so hard to get rid of plus two to their save is just silly amazing but i was running them and i had planted them turn one because it was a death guard army why he's coming right at me why why wouldn't i plant them turn one and i needed to challenge him midfield because it was this is my favorite type of game it's a complete fucking slaughter yep. basically both sides are wiping each other out and it's great i had I had a bunch of stuff in his back line going after his pox walkers and then like his terminator unit came up and got blown away and the mortarian came up killed a bunch of stuff then got blown away it sounds like you were using classic j general tactics which, which is kill everything kill everything yeah i mean like yeah they're it's it's an elimination but sir what about the mission the mission is kill <laughs> Yeah, well, which is especially hard because going against Death Guard, I mean, it's just... That's a very hard mission to achieve. <laughs> yeah, so, and he made one mistake, but then in one turn, he used the Select an Infantry Unit. It's a, a stratagem they have, and that intri- Infantry Unit gains the character rule, so mm. then you can't target them. Un- That's right. Sniper. That's a really good stratagem they have. It's very strong. It's important to know when to use it at the right time, but it made it possible for him to basically contend the primary. Because he had just two Plague Marines left in a unit, and he put them onto an objective that was worth three points, but it was out in the open, and he was like, character rule. And suddenly, I couldn't do anything about it, and I was like... Because what did he have in front of those guys? I mean, like, it was like two Plague drones and, like, a bunch of other stuff that you just... There's just no way yeah, I could kill Yeah, just wait to kill all that stuff to get um, to it. Especially since the thing that could kill the most would be the robots, but I have to declare all their shots at once, which means I couldn't even declare against them. Like, it wasn't possible with the oh, game. Oh, that's brutal. But I made the mistake of not changing them back to the Aegis Protocol so I could move them on the next turn, and I was out of CP... So I couldn't emergency protocol. Gotta have that CP. So then when my next turn came around, I was like, oh, fuck. And I had five robots left with no targets just sitting in my deployment zone. I basically just had to wait a turn. And the only reason I won the game now, the new experimental rules are changing this. But the only reason I won the game is because the game went an extra turn and basically negated that turn. Of That's me good. just standing there. That's the only reason I won is because the extra turn happened. It was like that turn that they were standing there just never happened. Yeah, it never happened, it right? It never happened. They're just now they're moving. We are productive. Because I had to I had to move them because, I mean, a lot of people don't realize that robots are fast. They're, they're eight-inch moves. Eight inches, right? Yeah. God. They're really quick. And then, like, I was able to advance and get them to midfield now, in one turn. since they're the same speed as Harlequins, can we confirm that these robots also do backflips and jump through the air? I mean, why wouldn't they? I mean, there's a lot of art of depicting them doing this right yeah everybody course. knows that's that's the fluff you right? see it, i mean just imagine parkour except the thing is 20 feet tall and weighs like six tons but he's doing parkour <laughs> it's like the iron giant doing parkour through a city yeah it's really great <laughs> But yeah, that's my C's. I screwed up and I forgot about the stupid uh, the stupid protocols and it basically almost cost me the game. Yeah, it's. I think that's like a C's that like for a while, even still, like I know getting back into Eldar, I'm going to be thinking of like old 7th edition like approaches to things. It's just not how it is anymore. Yeah, it's just hard to get out of it. That, that 7th haze is just... It's there for a while. Well, that was an awesome C's and now that takes us to our main segment, the Brown Library. <laughs> Well, here we are in the Brown Library. It's odd, you know? I feel like the Harlequins would have been more excited about the Eldari Codex, but they seem kind of bitter about it, I feel. Well, it's because they don't have their own codex. They don't yet. get their own codex, yeah. It'll happen eventually for these guys. Don't don't worry. Don't worry. You'll get your own. They, they don't. They don't. They don't look happy. They don't look happy, yeah. 
I, maybe they thought their minus one to hits were really special, so maybe they're kind of frustrated now it's, that it still is. Jay. I think it is still pretty it special. Still is, and they do it with mirages. They get to do it with like cool laser light sound effects. Yeah, so I think. I mean, they're literally a laser light show. Yeah, we still think it's special. Full support. I gave them a thumbs up. They don't know what that means. Yeah, they don't. I. We should really learn what hand gestures yeah, mean in relation to Harlequins. Oh God, <laughs> we might have to defend ourselves now. But um, before we build our own fort in the Brown Library. What army are we talking about this month? Well, preemptively before the release, we're doing something we don't normally do. We're actually getting ahead of the game. Whoa, what? That's right. We have time travel capabilities? Well, I mean, wibbly wobbly warpy stuff. Oh, okay. Well, those are definitely different. Yes. So I accept. <laughs> uh, we're going to be talking about Eldari. We're making it. I made an Eldari list for us. What? Includes a bunch of things you never really see. Blasphemy! But also is preemptively using some of the rules that have been released. And we will preface this. A lot of this is still speculation because it's not in hard writing or anything. But, you know, has been confirmed by people that have read the book. But, you know, it's Or still are, not. like, reading out of the book. Yes, but it's still, like, over the internet and not in front of me. And therefore, I don't trust it. Yeah. So... Well, you got all your information from one guy in a comment section, right? It was just like, here's all the numbers, right? Exactly. Yes. Yeah, and those people are always right. 100% trustworthy. <laughs> um, but these are from reliable sources. Reliable sources, yes. So going off of the what we've discussed previously with regards to how we think is probably the, the best configurations to do with the new army, but at the same time also tossing in a lot of things that I think got buffs that people are still overlooking hmm. and are actually really strong now. We technically have three detachments. We do. We have one battalion detachment that is elatic because... It's so good. Lady is God minus one across the board. So in this detachment, we have for our HQs Morgan Ra. Oh yeah, who's our warlord? So Morgan Ra is taking the mark of the incomparable hunter, which is a general warlord trade, but it is a pretty good one. It gives them sniper, mm -hmm. which now you're talking about an eight shot Morgan Ra that always hits on twos. And now I'll preface: he does he has a two plus ballistic skill. But he's got the Reaper rule, except his is better. He literally always hits on twos. No matter what. And he re-rolls ones. Yeah. He almost can't miss. Yeah. With and eight that, shots. With eight shots and a 36-inch range, which means that he's a nightmare for mid-level characters like commissars, like space marine lieutenants, anything like anything that. Anything that's just like those general aura buffing dudes that are just hanging out in the back being like, yeah. please don't shoot me. Now he can do that. Our other HQ is ironically an Elatic Sniper. Mm. Illic Night Spear. Yeah. Uh, who now with the Elatic trait, and we'll need to read the actual codex to see if it's like, if you already have a thing that does this, then you don't also get I this. I mean, it's typically how that stuff works in the past is if it has the same name, but the Great Workshop itself has already said that Rangers already have with their camo cloaks the built-in minus one, and they will get another minus one from the Elatic trait. So I'm assuming Illic has the exact same camo cloak type ability. Well, ironically, he is already of the Elatic craft world. Mm -hmm. Like, that is his craft world. Yep. So he would get that trait, and his ability is just called Hunter Unseen. It's not the Elatic trait. So yeah, he would get both, which means Elatic also has the native minus two to hit. Yep. And then he gets plus two to his saving cover. So he's... And he's a character... So he's really hard to get rid of. Yeah. He's annoying. So really you have Mog and Ra and Illic in the backfield just being like, so who do we want to kill right now? Oh, that guy? Yeah, I mean, because they're both snipers. Like, that's the thing that's crazy about it is that essentially they both have the sniper rule. Illic has a single shot weapon that's minus three AP and D3 and always wounds on a two plus unless it's a vehicle. So that's really mean. Yeah, and the background on uh, Illic, I don't know too much about Illic's background in, t in terms of fluff, but Mog and Ra's background is pretty rad. Uh, There's stories of him like literally taking down entire ships like just shooting things like out of the sky like himself there is there is one story of him against one of the uh i believe it was one of the crack and splinter fleets of him basically just like killing like dozens of yeah. synapse creatures all in one go essentially yeah there's just like him standing on like the bow of a craft world just be like i got this <laughs> just taking down entire fleets himself yeah to be fair he is a phoenix lord he's a phoenix lord he is the phoenix lord of the dark reapers and this goes into what's in the rest of the detachment mm. so our three troops that we're required to take are of course three units of rangers yeah. because the they're just min rangers units of five because rangers are incredible 
incredible now. They went down in points cost. They're just very good. So this is like the They're sniper detachment. 12 points now. Yeah, 12 points. For one dude. Uh, with a minus two to hit. Minus two to hit if they're Ladic. And they've and also got a plus two to their armor save if they're in cover instead of just yeah. a plus one. And they infiltrate. God, they're real strong. Yeah. That's essentially the core. So then the the finisher, because of course we took Mogren Ra, who, spoilers, Mogren Ra is my favorite Eldar character. <laughs> Surprise! Um, <laughs> we took as well as a heavy in the Elatic Detachment, three units of seven Dark Reapers. Because one, Dark Reapers are insanely good. They also went down in cost, which... Not sure who made that choice, sure. but I'll take it. Yeah, I'll take it for sure. <laughs> they also uh, happily deny all of the minus one and minus shenanigans that Eldar now have because they always hit on threes. Yeah, so Reapers are actually kind of an interesting counter to Eldar. Yeah, I mean, in they, Eldar. they even specified they still hit on threes against things like Kalexis Assassins. Yeah, because there was so. an FAQ about it, and they were like, uh, but like, does this still affect Kalexis? It's like, yeah, Dark Reapers, three plus every just, time. Uh, the Kalexis just makes your BS and your weapon skills a six plus. It doesn't say that the, you have to hit on this. Therefore, it makes sense that they would always hit on threes. So. Yeah, Reaper's like, nah, man, I've been at the range every day working on my shot. <laughs> yeah, so they're very strong. And of course, then if they're near Mog and Ra, then they also reroll ones to hit, which is just like making it, you know, already good, even better. Pretty strong. <laughs> so yes, very, very strong core. Everything has a minus one to hit beyond 12 inches. The Rangers and Illic have a minus two to hit beyond 12 inches. Just a nightmare to get rid of and a great core ranged army that basically can handle any target in the game it's basically so kind of how we're seeing this army take shape they're kind of your backfield support they're your home a home field advantage yeah we'll call it yeah that's why they get the minus one it's home field and with rangers which is really neat is because they can infiltrate and because you can have a whole bunch of them right you have three units here you can basically infiltrate them out after the fact to counter deploy against potential deep strikers that are going to come in and attack Morgan and and the reapers in the backfield and other infiltrators i mean like it's depending on who goes first i mean there have been armies even with admech and stuff of using like big dragoon units and stuff and, and infiltrating them so yeah any way you can push back that nine inch drop is really huge very important so then the second half Mm. of the army is we're going wraith focused whoa so uh now is this anari shenanigan wraith focus no 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 no. none of that bs get out of here get out of here get get the fuck out of here anari No, this is uh, based off of the Eandin craft world. Mm, I love that. I love that craft world. Uh, it's very cool. Uh, Fluff-wise, they're probably my favorite. Yeah. Um, Aladic are really cool, too. If anybody doesn't know, Aladic craft world, they're much more like, uh, I guess you would call them globe trotters, but like universe trotters. They're like, they're, they're more the ones that are like exploring planets that nobody's been on and like kind of writing out the map of the universe that yeah. the Eldar hasn't explored. So they're, they're really cool in that way. They're very much more like wayfarers. Yeah. Essentially. Essentially, um, while explorers, yes. Yandon, just real, real sad, real sad craft yeah. world. Well, Yandon lo- uh, lost most of its craft world to a Tyranid Hive fleet, mm-hmm. and this that's why they have essentially more ghost units, like, more wraith units than any other armies because they kind of had to. Yeah, like, we could talk a little bit about that. I don't think we've ever talked about the background of what a wraith guard or a wraith lord or a wraith knight structure is yeah so if you're not fully familiar with eldar or you're new to this eldar have to have this thing on them well specifically eldari craft world eldari have this thing on them called a spirit stone and what happens is when they die their soul essentially gets sucked into this spirit stone which it's like is a, it's like, like a backup like file for them it basically. is it's like it's like a server built for their soul so that they can you know they don't oh well, there's a very specific reason for yeah. this and that's because the eldar were originally the most debauched, horrible, awful race in the galaxy by a long shot. Some of them still are. They're called the Drakari. They're called the Drakari now. The um, Dark Eldar. They pretty much kept to the same ways. Yeah, they're like, eh, why, why break a good thing, yeah. right? Torture and madness, but their debauchery birthed a chaos god called Slanash. Now that's when you know you've taken your debauchery to top levels. Um, in fact, the giant warp storm that was previously kept at bay by Cadia, no longer, called the Eye of Terror was caused by the birth of Slanesh. Mm -hmm. So imagine, like, they create this chaos god. The Eye of Terror, by the way, was where the core of their civilization was. Yep, all gone. And 95 to 9% of their race died simultaneously, and all of their souls were sucked into Slanesh, because Slanesh is literally always trying to eat them. It's like... 
the worst of the worst. So that's why they have these spirit stones is to prevent themselves from getting eaten when they die. Yeah. So a wraith construct is built from the same materials that all of their weapons are made from, which are more grown than manufactured. Yeah, it's really cool. There's in Eldar lore and like kind of in their culture, they have these uh, groups of things called bone singers. Yes. And basically what they do is they grow and shape. It's kind of like, think about how like when people, you know, long, long time ago on Terra, when people used to uh, cut up these things called like bonsai trees or they would like shape trees and grow them in a specific pattern or shape. That's what bone singers do. Yeah, they take this psychoactive substance called wraith bone and they essentially sing it very quite now what literally. kind of songs do you think they use is uh, it mostly doo-wop or uh no i mean they go heavy metal when they it's go weapons. heavy metal yeah oh oh when it's weapons you're yeah. right i forgot yeah i mean like they it depends jay on what they're building but and like but if they're building a bed it's it's very white all yeah. the way oh, of course oh, yeah i mean baby. it's got the sexiest oh damn bed <laughs> ever <laughs> it's just making a really nice comfy bed um but yeah they literally like tune the wraith bone into shapes and so the wraith constructs are a battle suit, essentially, constructed entirely from this psychoactive substance. But then they take these spirit stones of their dead comrades and they plug it into it like a CPU. Mm-hmm. And it takes control of the wraith unit. Yeah, and it's 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 not great for some of those souls because a lot of times their their mental capacity their thought is is muted um yeah everything's sort of delayed yeah and they're and they're more or less controlled by these things called spirit seers which are like uh specifically wraith based warlocks yeah you think of them as a focus like because they're seeing everything they don't they don't have eyes Mm -hmm. so they don't see normally they perceive the universe in a very different way and you think of the spirit seer as like a beacon essentially allows them to more clearly interpret what's around right but it's still like they're emotions and their intelligence is, is actually kind of dulled a bit in these wraith yes. constructs. So even though, yes, they kind of get a second life by being plugged into these these wraith units, it's not usually good. It's more of a half-life. They'd rather be life. in the uh, kind of the supercomputer of where all the spirit stones go, which is called the... Uh, the Infinity Matrix. Yeah, the Infinity Matrix. Um, but uh, sometimes Yandin's got to go to war. Sometimes the, you need to make some bone soldiers. Yeah, I mean... The fueled in- on death metal. The Infinity Matrix is essentially the man manufactured eldar afterlife because otherwise they get eaten by their their, their devil god yeah real real fun real yeah fun place the to. eldar have a rich happy history <laughs> whereas the extreme of this so wraith guard and wraith lords are piloted by a single soul a, a one spirit stone essentially can pilot those constructs but for the biggest ones which are like titans which we won't get into but the titanic wraith knight specifically that has to be piloted by of all things twins but one dead twin and one live twin. Yeah, it's like a cool version of Pacific Rim. Take that movie from thousands of years ago. Yeah, so they have to have twins, but one of the twins has to be dead and in a spirit stone and plugged into the thing, but then it also has to be cyclically attuned by its living twin who then also pilots it. It's really cool. It's a cool mechanic, and so, like, Eandon is very focused on these things because most of their population is dead, and they have to use lots of wraith constructs. Do you wonder if there's ever a situation where, like, uh, someone's like, hey so i heard uh i heard you had twins yeah we had two twins it's like oh cool 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 um they're gonna go in and train for the military yeah i think they might go into like the aspect yeah yeah, yeah, one yeah. one might suffer an unfortunate training accident yeah they might just uh, one might just disappear what did you say oh no, no no nothing we're gonna take care of your twins definitely gonna take care of at least one of them yeah well you think like it's already rare enough to have twins yep but then to also have one of them die and then also recover the spirit stone. It's weird. Most of these twins, they just they have all these unfortunate accidents in the training program. I'm assuming that they also, the living one at least, because there's just still consciousness in the dead one, but like they have to consent to be a wraith knight. It's, yeah, it's really weird. It, uh, a lot of a lot of pianos are dropping on uh, on guardians yeah, well, during their training in the end. And we'll just we'll just we'll, moving on. Moving oh, I'm on. sorry. I'll, another piano. My good. Is that? Oh my god. Another twin. Well, I guess we lucked out, guys, because we got another wraith knight. Well, 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 moving on. Moving on. We'll yep. go. We'll go past that. So the end in their faction focus, the craft world focus for them is that the wraith constructs, if they have a degrading profile, they actually count the number of wounds they remaining by two, which means that. That 
their degrading profile almost never happens until they're in the lowest possible levels. Yeah, they always double those wounds. So basically, if they're at seven wounds, typically that means that... For a Wraith Knight. For a Wraith Knight. That means they would be in their second tier, which is, I believe, seven to 12. But because it's Eanded and they have that specific Eanded trait, it's two times, so it's actually 14, which means they get no degrade at all. Yeah, so they are up, up until... And this is a 24-wound model. So up until seven wounds, they're still in their first profile and then six to four wounds they're still in their second profile and then they're not in their last profile until they're basically already dead anyway it's crazy to have a 24 wound model to be at seven wounds and still be fully functioning and then you take it into consideration with regards to wraith lords and wraith lords are basically at their full profile until they're under three wounds yeah which is a big deal that basically means they're fully functioning until they have two wounds remaining which is like they're basically dead anyway so we have a spearhead detachment that's in and that's just a spirit seer and three wraith lords all with shuriken because that now that they can fire all their weapons they're actually an amazing shuriken platform because they can move it's you know it's not a heavy weapon so they can move unhindered and fire all their weapons yeah, at full capacity. that is an advantage because like, yeah, it's tough to give them heavy weapons because they have that minus one to hit, so you exactly. want to keep them at that three plus ballistic skill. And now even more so because they have the and and trait, that means that essentially until their two wounds remaining, they're firing a BS3 always Which with is all awesome. those shuriken weapons, and they're still pretty good in combat. And I mean, like, they're relatively cheap now, so like three wraith lords is actually 30 wounds it's really hard to get rid of and they're now t8 because with yes. the new codex they boost their toughness so now they went from t7 to t8 which is huge it's enormous melta and similar weapons like it most, missiles i believe yes, as well most of the anti-tank weapons in the game are strength eight specifically like the average access anti-tank weapons are strength eight which means they went from a three plus to a four plus to wound it's huge that's a big deal and then the last detachment we have huh, it's ironic we were talking about this so much is a super heavy detachment that's eandon and it's a wraith knight yep because the wraith knight now with eandon now we had actually a bit of a debate about this whether it's stronger to have him as elatic or to have him as eandon i came to the consensus at least that most of the things that are going to be killing the wraith knight are going to be doing so at the 12 inches or less which means that dropping in close with like uh plasma or dropping in close with melta or or, something or even combat units like morty or something else something that can legitimately kill a wraith knight like it's going to be under that 12 inches which means that like the elatic doesn't really matter whereas if you have it's also i think how you kind of use the wraith knight i think in this army it looks like you're having the wraith knight positioned as a forward attack right you have it in the front you have essentially this spearhead of three wraith lords and the wraith knight surrounding a spirit seer to be your frontline spearhead because that can take out a lot of stuff. Oh, yeah. And it's a bad unit to necessarily charge. And the Wraith Knight is good in... We gave him two uh, heavy D cannons because the heavy D cannons are so good. Um, And two star cannons. So he's a gun platform But that's the advantage of being Titanic is that he can go in, stomp the shit out of something, and then just back out. Yeah, it is really really, good. really strong. So the Wraith Knight and now being and, and that means it's degrading stats. You basically have to kill it or it's at full capacity. Yeah, I'm very excited about an army like this. I'm very interested to see how the new Eldar plays with these, like having the two different craft worlds playing off of each other of Eandon being this like really hard shield at the front like taking a lot more damage and shrugging it off yes while you've got Eladic in the back which is just like really hard to dislodge to anything that's not combat or ironically dark reaper is just a nightmare to get rid of yeah and dark reaper is getting now that minus one to hit them yeah they were already tough before but now whoo so uh what's the name of this list well okay so I have a name for it, but because it's more your army, I'll allow you name it, because if you don't name it, I'm calling it Pointy-Eared Bastards. I mean, it's just happening. No! <laughs> can't call it Pointy-Eared Bastards. Um, let me see. Sneaky Ghosts. No. <laughs> <laughs> How about Elatic is the New Black? Sure. We'll call, we'll call it that. Instead of Pointy-Eared Bastards? I, they will always be Pointy-Eared Bastards in the back of my head, but sure, Elatic is, the new, is the new Black. It it's is just, the New Black. It's just... It's so good. There's going to be a lot of armies that are. Yeah, I think we're going to still see some support. I think we're going to see like support from like Beel Tan. I think we'll see support from Eandon like this. Oh, and I hope that I mean, like, it's not saying that the other craft worlds aren't good. Like, 
it, it, like we said, Oathway is still good. Mm-hmm. Sam Hain is still good. I think Aladic is just the easy choice. It's the easy slot for anything, really. Yeah. It's just in the rest that that secondary detachment is all going to be kind of based on your playstyle because, like, I just can't see. I mean, even just Aladic making, not being at least one part of it. I mean, army. even just making Aladic Vol support batteries. Now they're giving them minus one. It's yeah. like it's just like having that. Just being able to grant the minus one automatically by making it Aladic so good is just very strong. Wow! All right, guys, Aladic is the new black. <laughs> It's here. Well, guys, that was episode 40 of Roll to Seas. We'll be posting a new episode of this segment every last Wednesday of the month with episodes of Dark Heresy the first and second Wednesday and 40K Arena every third Wednesday. And if you'd like to download more episodes or check out other similar podcasts, head over to partialarc.com. You can email us any questions at rolldeceas at gmail.com. Of course, you can always follow us on Twitter and Instagram for tournament and model picks at partialarc. Thanks for listening, and your fun fact for this month is... You know, for them, it's supposed to be, like, the most pompous, arrogant race in the galaxy. Uh-huh. I don't see enough of that in their stratagems. Like a Not just enough like, pompousness? Like, a, 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 a sh- I shook my finger, it doesn't happen. <laughs> nah. Nuh-uh. It's, it's just a stratagem. <laughs> it's just called nah. nuh for three CP. You have to shake your finger yeah, at Yeah, you gotta do it for sure. <laughs> that's, like, that's almost like old Age of Sigmar rules or whatever it was. Yeah, I feel like that's, like, that, that's like denying power. nuh uh, <laughs> someone tries to do a psychic power and goes if you have a farseer within 24 inches you could spend 3 CP and just cancel well it. I mean I consider the, the Gryo or whatever the faction that uh, Admech has where all their units can just logic psychic powers away just, yeah. uh, my science proves that that is not real that's the thing Eldar would be like if they were pompous about one thing it would be about psychic powers they'd be like well, you think you can do your psychic powers we did that first yeah. it's like, what? <laughs>